Good morning, this is Pastor Rick, and I want to welcome you to the Sunday Forum on this Sunday, April the 25th, where we are going to talk about the Derek Chauvin trial in Minneapolis. Uh, but before we get into that conversation, uh, and that conversation is going to be with a friend of Emmanuel, uh, Pastor Kelly Chapman in Minneapolis. He's been down here before and done the Sunday Forum. Uh, we wanted to hear from him about the churches in Minneapolis, the population, how are they responding to this important trial. All eyes in the United States are on the people of Minneapolis, and so we wanted to hear from one of the leaders in Minneapolis about how he views the trial and what he's trying to do constructively to help Christians and others uh, prepare for the results. Uh, but before we go to the interview, I wanted to mention a few things that have happened since we filmed this interview with Kelly Chapman uh, two weeks ago. Uh, first of all, even as we film uh, today in preparation for the Sunday Forum, there has been no verdict announced. So we don't know the verdict yet. But also, as you remember, Dante Wright, 20 years old, black man, just a few miles from where the trial is taking place in Minneapolis, he was shot by a policeman during the trial and after I had my interview with Kelly. And so that's new information, as well as the death of Adam Toledo in Chicago, that 13-year-old boy. So that has, uh, these killings have heightened the tension and the drama around this trial of Derek Chauvin. And I should add in the New York Times, uh, they did a survey of the whole country and found out that there were about three police killings each day since the trial began on March the 29th. And over 50% of those who've been killed are black and brown. And so again, that's part of the context uh, that we want to set up as we now hear from Kelly Chapman, and again, what he's trying to do to help in a constructive way, uh, help people deal with the trial. I would like to also suggest a few things myself. And the first is, if you're watching the trial or commentary about the trial this week, watch more than one source. Um, it's always good to get our news from more than one source today, so we're hearing various angles, how different commentaries uh, approach the trial and the verdict. Uh, secondly, let's remember our seven principles of civil discourse and spiritual discernment. It's not that we're going to discuss it here at Emmanuel necessarily, but you will be discussing the trial probably uh, at home with family and friends. And so remember what we bring to that conversation, the spiritual disciplines we bring, which are respect, listening, speaking for ourselves, trying to understand other viewpoints first, gratitude, forgiveness, and the Eighth Commandment. When we say the Eighth Commandment, we put the best spin on someone else's viewpoint. We don't always try to undermine the other or uh, consider that the motivations they have behind their views are somehow nefarious and wrong. And finally, and this is more of a personal matter, I think, but I pass it on to you. Uh, let's lift up the trial and the people of Minneapolis in our prayers. I've been watching the trial uh, pretty closely for the last two weeks, but I have to admit, I have not been praying about it. I haven't been lifting up those who have been affected in prayer. I haven't been praying for the people of Minneapolis and for calm in the city, no matter what the verdict is. So I really haven't approached the trial in a, I would say, a spiritual way. What we all believe as Christians is that prayer makes a difference and so we should be practicing prayer. I just realized that this weekend. I have watched for two weeks and have not once prayed for the people of Minneapolis. And so, as you know, we have many members there, but we have many Christians, we have many non-Christians who need our prayer at this time as we pray for God's peace over that city. And so now we want to introduce Kelly Chapman as he discusses his constructive moves in approaching the trial. Let's go over to the interview right now. Good morning, this is Pastor Rick, and I want to welcome you to the Sunday Forum on this Sunday, April 25th. We're glad that you could join us, 
as we continue our conversation here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church on racial justice. And we're really happy to have a friend of the congregation, uh, Kelly Chapman, to be with us. Kelly, you were here about a year ago. Uh, at that time, you were still pastor of Redeemer Lutheran Church, where you had been for quite some time. Now I know you're in a, a brand new ministry in North Minneapolis, and we're going to hear about that ministry in just a few seconds. But first, we just want to welcome you, uh, Kelly, to the Sunday Forum. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. It's great to be back. You, you know, uh, Kelly, we thought about you uh, this last month because all eyes are on Minneapolis these days with the Derek Chauvin trial. And so I thought we could start our conversation today uh, with Minneapolis. I mean, we're all watching you. How are Minnesotans, how are those from Minneapolis now responding to the trial so far? Now, it's, a, it's a pretty big impact on Minneapolis, recognizing that the attention is on Minneapolis uh, nationally and internationally uh, following the, the death and the trial of uh, Derek Chauvin uh, for the death of George Floyd. And paying attention to that is uh, our community is really, there's great interest. And, uh, and again, it's not just about Minnesota, but it's, it's a global um, concern. In many ways, it's uh, kind of very similar to the pandemic. Uh, mm. that the, the issues and uh, the anguish of the struggles and and how to adapt to all that is happening is something that's really hitting Minnesota. And one of the uh, experiences I'm having is that for the white community, there's tremendous uh, interest and concern, uh, empathy. Uh, and then for the black community, there's fatigue and trauma as you know this uh, the experience and, and wondering what will come of the trial is is there really any positive outcome, no matter what the outcome is? And, and on top of that, just yesterday, a, a young man, Dante Wright, was killed uh, at 10 miles away in Brooklyn Park uh, in a police encounter. And, and so, again, that elevates that concern, the anguish. Uh, all, all of those emotions are, are, are escalated in the midst of, of this trial that, that is capturing uh, national and, uh, and international attention. You know, Kelly, uh, we've been holding uh, sessions here on the Sunday Forum since George Floyd's death in May, and we've learned uh, a lot about issues of racial justice. We've also learned a lot about ourselves and the, the type of ideologies, the type of commitments uh, that we bring to this conversation. But one of the things that I've found quite helpful is that you've also, knowing the tension, the different approaches to racial justice that are in your community or in the Lutheran churches that surround you, uh, you've started a prayer vigil uh, which will help support a healthy community and a healthy church. Uh, tell us about that prayer vigil. How does it work and what's been the fruit of that labor? So we have gathered uh, leaders to convene a time of prayer every morning from 8 to 8.30 in the morning uh, throughout the trial. And um, and it's leaders, uh, some of you may know of Don and Sandra Sanders who are leaders in, in Minneapolis, North Minneapolis. Uh, Don is a member on the Luther Seminary Board and a former council person. Uh, so we're convening a time of prayer, uh, interfaith and uh, and, and each day, there's five minutes of, of reflection time of what we pray for the judge, the jury, the families. And so, mm. so they're gathering around prayer. And each morning, uh, we have uh, uh, more than 300 people that are gathering for prayer. Uh, we have it live, and then we have it on Facebook throughout the day. Um, I encourage you, it's at www.healingourcity.com. But Kelly, is, are most of the people from Minnesota or from Minneapolis, or are the people who join this prayer vigil, are they from around the country? It, it's both. It's primarily the, the Twin Cities, but we have people from Canada, um, Japan, 
uh, Oregon. So it's, it's quite a gathering. Um, and many of the people are um, uh, my age and, um, and, and older uh, that are coming um, you know, for, for various reasons. Um, but we have, um, but we also have drawn um, uh, Krista Tippett, who's a national right. person. Um, so there are leaders that are beyond the Twin Cities, as well as local pastors and uh, uh, rabbis. And so, um, so those reflection times are led by faith leaders. Uh, today, our faith leader was Remai Nash Habi uh, from Chicago and uh, a Muslim leader. Um, but 95% um, of those that are participating are Christian, um, but we're gathering together around different faiths uh, and praying uh, for for the, the trial and, and all of its facets. Now, how long does the prayer vigil last every day? Uh, half an hour. 30 minutes? 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, yes. I, I, I thought I'd heard one time it lasted 29 minutes and and uh, sort of reflected uh, the time of the officer's knee on George Floyd's neck. That's an important, so the structure of it, uh, there's an introduction, so we have a host each day, uh, introducing the day, uh, and then the five minute reflection, and then after the reflection, nine minutes and 29 seconds of silence. Or we ring a bell, uh, it's called a singing bowl, and then that time of silence. And then after that, then there's music and people are able to share their reflections in the chat. So it's really rigidly held to that 30 minute time. You know, Kelly, I, I'm used to seeing you at uh, Redeemer Lutheran Church, in North Minneapolis. And by the way, uh, that is the congregation where Pastor Steve did part of his internship work while he was a seminary student at Luther Seminary. I know it was uh, an emotional moment when we visited you last time in the Twin Cities with some of our staff, and he uh, sat out on that front uh, area, on those front stairs, where he had uh, had some experiences with the neighborhood that he was reflecting on. Uh, but you, you were there leading a congregational conversation for so long. Now you're playing a different role, especially in response to this trial. Tell us about the center. Tell us about its work and your role at the center in regards to racial justice. Well, the center is an outgrowth of a campaign with the Minneapolis Area Senate, Lutheran Social Services, and Redeemer Center for Life, the nonprofit at Redeemer. And, and for me, it's very much an extension of my role as pastor and redeemer, now I'm a pastor in the community. And, and with that, we have a board that I just feel like I'm the most blessed pastor in the world. My board, like Steve Delzer, a retired bishop, is on our board. Um, uh, Paul Slack, who is the, the president of the Isaiah Community Organizing. Um, Myron uh, Holden, who was on the ELCA Church Council have a really wonderful diverse board. And the mission of the, of the board is to encourage congregations to have a presence beyond the walls of our church buildings, much like Emmanuel does in your community, but to encourage more congregations to be engaged in the community, but for Lutherans and congregations and denominations to transcend the boundaries of race, class, and culture. And so ways to engage that life with the prayer uh, time, but how do people come into relationship with one another beyond the, beyond the, the places of cultural comfort? Um, and, and so we focus on assets, we, we focus on helping people to engage their community and that presence of being the church beyond our walls. Uh, and, and, and for me, reframing that to see the church as we do in worship about um, a place of welcome, safety, and belonging, but that is not confined to our experience on Sunday morning. But how do we exhibit that as disciples in the places where we work and we play and we study? You know, Kelly, I was really encouraged when we were up there and you were describing the work of the center, how many Lutheran institutions have played a role in supporting or uh, initiating, uh, creating, uh, the center. I found that very encouraging. And yet you've had to begin your work at, you know, 
at a fraught time, right, with the trial, with the violence, at a, a difficult time because of COVID. So I've been interested to hear that you've written a book to help congregations like Emmanuel and others trying to have a conversation, a productive engagement with the topic of racial justice. Tell us about the book and what kind of conversations has it generated so far? Well, the book is really out of my experience as, a, as an African-American Lutheran who have, have gone through the process of assimilation. You know, the schools that I went to, I, I was often the only one or one of a few. And, and the acknowledgement, awareness that for 400 years, you know, black and marginalized people have been talking about racism, but that hasn't really gotten a lot of attention from the white community. And now with the death of George Floyd, Philando Castile, that litany of deaths, there's a growing, growing awareness and say that there really is a problem here. And what that's elevated has been white consciousness and white empathy but there's a gap for uh, black and marginalized people that there's fatigue, uh, there's, there's uh, uh, anguish. So there's, there's a gap between those two experiences. So how do we come together and have those conversations? And so really the book is a prep for really white people to be able to like, read about my story as a black person in white spaces and then questions that are there for white people to have their own conversation, processing their own thoughts about difference um, and how that connects with, with race. And, and, and the goal of the book is to be able to talk about race w without the challenge of, of guilt, blame, or shame. And so it really is intended for some good discussions among white people that, to be able to talk about race in ways that help them move and prepare for bridging that gap that doesn't that also exists in the places where people gather with diversity but not in real authentic relationships. I think that's so important and what we will do here at Emmanuel uh, Kelly is we'll run off some copies of that book because you can get it online and we'll make it available online but we'll also print off some cop from copies through Emmanuel Academy so uh, that if you don't have a printer at home, you can get, uh, again, these copies, because it helps, I would guess, not only have the conversation for whites in congregations, but in our families as well. And, and I, I want to kind of close on this, Kelly, because you, you just mentioned it. It's a hard conversation uh, for whites to have, but especially with whites and, and blacks in the same room. There's just so much... Um, disagreement, even on language, let alone ideologies. And often then a fatigue can set in, right? Oh, we've had that conversation already. Do we have to continue? Or how do we continue and still be productive? So uh, what could you share with us on how we might continue the conversation about racial justice here in Emmanuel in a fruitful, productive way? Well, I think it really goes back, I'm glad you're asking this question. For me, it goes back to what it means to be church. So when we gather on Sunday mornings, people come from all kinds of backgrounds. And there's a core commitment that we, when we worship, we worship and we say, everybody is welcome, everybody is safe, everybody belongs. That's what it means to enter in this space where we worship God. Well, let's take that belief beyond worship and carry that into the places where we work and we play and we study. And I believe that that real core understanding about what it means to be the people of God, we take that out into the world as a core identity and belief as Christians. And that is what can transform the world. That in the world of God is for everybody, where everybody to be welcome, safe, and belong. Well, thanks for sharing that, Kelly, and being with us here on this morning. Uh, as we tape... Uh, this Sunday forum, the trial has not ended, so we don't know the results of the Chauvin trial, and we don't know the results uh, for your city, for Minneapolis, for Minnesotans, and so we want to join you in prayer. We want to lift up so many different parties uh, who are participating, who have a lot at stake in the trial and the results of the trial, 
But we also pray for Emmanuel, for Lutheran congregations across the country, uh, that we could continue this conversation, creating the kind of church, as you mentioned, uh, that's a welcoming place for all. I want to thank you again, uh, Kelly, for joining us. Say hi to your wife, Cheryl. <laughs> Haven't seen her in a while. Uh, and we want to thank you for joining us this morning at the, on the Sunday Forum. Bye-bye now. <laughs>